Oregonians face an important decision as they vote this fall. Who do you want to lead the state for the next four years? Tonight, KGW News and The Oregonian bring you a debate between the top two candidates in the race for governor, Democrat Kate Brown and Republican Newt Bueller. The candidates will answer video questions submitted by dozens of Oregonians. Plus, take questions by our panel of veteran political journalists. From KGW News, The Oregonian, and Oregon Live, this is Decision 2018, the debate for Oregon's governor. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final debate for Oregon Governor. I'm Tracy Berry with KGW News. Tonight, the combined newsrooms of KGW and the Oregonian are here to serve you. For the next hour, you will hear directly from the candidates to help you make an informed choice when you vote for Oregon's next governor. And we're joined by the top two candidates seeking the job tonight, Kate Brown, a Democrat and our current governor, and Newt Bueller, a Republican and state representative from Beautiful Bend. Quickly, here's what you can expect tonight. The candidates will take questions from our panel of political journalists, including Laurel Porter from KGW, Steve Dean from The Oregonian, and Hilary Borud, also from The Oregonian. PSU professor Chris Carey's back with us to try to keep everybody on time. Couldn't do it without you, Carey. And we'll also play video questions submitted by dozens of people from around the state. These have been great. Thank you so much to everybody who sent us questions. And you can continue the discussion through tonight's debate by tweeting with the hashtag OR Gov debate. We're going to kick things off with our panel and two questions from Steve Dean. So buckle up. Hey, Representative Bueller, good evening. In a state that last elected a Republican governor 36 years ago, and in an age where far too many Republican candidates are marching lockstep with Donald Trump, how do you, how do you persuade Oregonians to vote red instead of seeing red? Well, first, thanks for having me. Thanks for, for uh, the panelists' uh, hard work on developing the questions, and thanks to KGW and the Oregonian for your efforts with this. Uh, what Oregonians may not realize is that uh, I represent the most Democratic district in the entire state held by a Republican. I'm used to making the case uh, of why people can trust me to, to lead with an open mind, a caring heart, and, an, and a thoughtful voice. Uh, and that means talking about issues that Oregonians care about care about. Big unsolved problems like the, the difficulties with our K-12 through education system, uh, one of the worst homeless problems in, in the nation, and vulnerable foster kids all across the state of Oregon that aren't getting adequate care under Governor Brown's administration. Those are the kinds of things people care about, no matter if you're a Democrat, Republican, or Independent, and those are the problems that I intend to solve as Oregon's next governor. Governor Brown, go ahead. Thank you for having us here tonight. It's been an incredible honor to serve as your governor for the last three and a half years. And I'm running for re-election because I believe that by working together, we can build a better Oregon. I'm the only candidate in this race with a track record of bringing Republicans and Democrats together across the state to tackle the problems facing Oregonians. We brought folks together to invest in our transportation system. We brought Republicans and Democrats together to continue funding for the Oregon Health Plan. I'm also a candidate uh, who has the guts to stand up against the Trump administration. When the Trump administration stomps on Oregon and Oregon values, and I will continue to do that, uh, as the governor of the great state of Oregon. I think it's critically important that we have a strong leader that reflects Oregon values, and I'm the leader Oregon needs. Governor, I'm glad you brought up the Oregon Health Plan. You know, whatever his blind spots, your predecessor, John Kitzhopper, was determined to tackle the state's most intractable problems, including health care and PERS. In the last three and a half to four years, have you shown similar ambition and the kind of results that merit a second term. Yes, uh, when I ran for election in 2016, I said I'd do three things. We've been able to make great strides on one of them and be able to accomplish two of them. 
Number one, making sure that we continue funding for the Oregon Health Plan. We now have 94% of adult Oregonians that have access to health care. And with my leadership, we now have 98% of children. I was able to get the bipartisan support to pass a bill called Cover All Kids, ensuring that 18,000 children, regardless of where they came from, have access to the Oregon Health Plan. My opponent voted no on that particular measure. I also was able to bring Oregonians together, Republicans and Democrats, to uh, invest in the most comprehensive transportation package in Oregon history, investing in our roads and bridges, congestion reduction, seismic resilience, and for the first time ever, investments in public transit in communities across the state, making sure that our seniors and our students can get where they need to go safely. Can, can I rebut that? Absolutely, uh, go yeah. for it. Yeah, well, let, let me be, be clear. Uh, I, I voted against uh, uh, Governor Brown's uh, plan to fund uh, Medicaid expansion, not because I wanted people to have less health care, but because I wanted people to have better health and less expensive care, and Governor Brown's plan failed on, on both accounts. Uh, uh, there's a severe lack, lack of accountability. Uh, the good news in Oregon is that uh, 400,000 more people have health care. The bad news is that uh, Governor Brown administrating this very important program wasted hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in mispayments, misallocated payments, and signing people up for Medicaid who shouldn't have been on it. Uh, I, my plan had accountability and importantly had bipartisan uh, support. Uh, Governor Brown did not and didn't come up with a stable long-term funding to make sure that Medicaid families have the security they need. Representative like, Bueller, I'd like a rebuttal. You know what? We're going to move on. Okay. We've got a lot of subjects to cover. Thank you, Governor. Representative Bueller, good evening. Good evening. Now that Brett Kavanaugh has been sworn into the U.S. Supreme Court, many women in Oregon are concerned about what that means for the future of women's reproductive rights in this country. You have said you are pro-choice, but you voted against a 2017 Oregon law that in part was aimed at making abortions and reproductive services more affordable. There's also some speculation amongst conservatives you might be open to restricting abortions if elected governor. I know this is a complex issue, but how do you convince Oregon women who are concerned about this that you would protect their reproductive rights and their health care? Yeah, sure. Uh Look, uh, Roe v. Wade is the law of the land. It will remain the law of the land in Oregon while I'm governor. Uh, and uh, I have been pro-choice uh, uh, most of my ad adult life, and it stems from being a physician. I believe in the, the, the importance, the personal nature of that relationship between uh, uh, a woman and her physician, where politics and, and government shouldn't intervene. Uh, and I believe in empowering women on this issue, uh, meaning I, in the legislature, wrote and passed the first bill in the nation to allow women to get access to birth control over the counter, the same kind of access that men have enjoyed for, for decades. Now, uh, you might ask why Governor Brown makes the claim that I'm not pro-choice, and the answer is a simple one. It's all about politics. Governor Brown knows that when people in Oregon understand that I'm pro-choice, I'm moderate, and I'm an independent-minded Republican, she is quite likely to lose this election. I'd like to just follow up. Is there any bill restricting abortion rights you would be open to if you were governor? As governor, I will not be changing any reproductive rights uh, legisla uh, laws that currently exist in, in Oregon. Governor Brown, go ahead. Thank you. I think with what's happening at the national level, it's critically important that women across the state have a true pro-choice champion, and I am that champion. I led the way to making sure that every single woman in this state, regardless of their income, regardless of their immigration status, and regardless of their zip code, have access to the reproductive health care. This is one of those things. Representative Bueller tells some voters one thing and other voters another. Unfortunately, that game won't work tonight because the whole state is watching. Not only did he vote no on the Women's Reproductive Health Act that would ensure that women had access to reproductive health care, he sought the right to life endorsement when he was running for the legislature. Can I, can I rebut that? No, I'm sorry. 
Hillary. Governor Brown, I'd like to turn next to the economy. Economists are saying that we could be headed into a recession in 2020. So I'm wondering, how are you preparing now for the next downturn when Oregon could be facing huge budget cuts? Well, I've talked to business leaders around the state, and one of the ones that I've talked to said state government needs to do three things. It was Tamara Lundgren at Schnitzer Steel. Number one, invest in infrastructure. Number two, make sure that we are investing in workforce development. And number three, that we're tackling regulatory reform. As you know, the economy is doing extremely well in Oregon right now under my administration. We have the lowest unemployment rate in Oregon history. Unfortunately, that economic prosperity doesn't include our rural communities and our low-income communities. That's why I've fought to invest in housing, in roads and bridges, in water infrastructure, and in broadband to meet our rural communities' needs. I've fought to uh, quadruple the funding for career and technical education so our students can have access to hands-on learning. And we also have a great uh, regional solutions team people on the ground in communities around the state working, working to cut red tape and make sure that our businesses can expand and grow in communities around Oregon. Representative. Yeah. Well, Governor Brown talks about uh, a lot of programs and percentages, uh, but at a time of record revenue, the state government have never had more revenue coming in, into the Treasury. Despite that, Governor Brown has signed into law $1.3 billion in new taxes. New taxes that Oregon has never even seen. Taxes, a new payroll tax, a new tax, sales tax on automobiles, a new health insurance tax. Think about what Governor Brown would do to your taxes in another four years in office. Now remember, this is at a time of record revenue. We need to plan for the future, and I'd propose putting some of the increased access that we've seen, fortunately, produced by hardworking Oregonians in a, in a rainy day fund to prepare for the future and make sure we protect important state programs. Okay, you guys, our first video question comes from Ron Pernick of Portland. He works in the clean energy field. Just want to remind you guys, you're both going to have a full minute to respond to this question. And um, Representative Bueller, you'll take the lead on this one right after we hear it. So here's the question. Governor Brown, Representative Bueller, solar and wind are now the most cost competitive sources of new energy and energy storage is rapidly declining in cost. Our neighbors to the south, California and Hawaii to the west, have both enacted 100% renewable energy targets by 2045. As governor, what will you do to ensure Oregon's leadership in a clean energy future? Okay, I'm gonna jump back in because I know you couldn't hear that at the beginning. Um, Ron's question was, solar and wind are now the most cost competitive sources of new energy and energy storage is rapidly declining in cost. Then he went on to mention, our neighbors to the south, California to the west, Hawaii, have both enacted renewable energy targets by 2045. As governor, what will you do to ensure Oregon's leadership in a clean energy future? Representative, yeah. we'll let you start. Yeah, well, well it's a very important question, an issue of, of vital concern. I certainly believe in uh, global climate change. I'm trained as a scientist, and the data is overwhelming. Uh, it's why I, I was one of the few Republicans to vote for transitioning Oregon's uh, electrical generation capacity from coal-based to, to renewables, uh, breaking with my party and, uh, and even business interest. Uh, it's why I have spoken out against the uh, Trump administration policies with regards to I environmental issues, specifically uh, United States uh, withdrawing from the, the Paris Paris Climate, Climate Accord. Uh, that's the kind of leadership that Oregonians want to see on these important issues. And I think it's important that we keep that balance, though. The balance to improving the, the environment, but also taking into consideration that there are hardworking Oregonians that are just struggling to get by every day, to pay the bills at the end of the month. And unfortunately, under Governor Brown, we've driven up the cost of living in this state, the high cost of health care, of housing, and now with energy costs, we have to be very, very careful that we don't challenge people too much with regards to these issues. Governor Brown. 
Well, as Oregonians, we're all feeling the impacts of global climate change. In the Rogue Valley alone this summer, they had roughly eight weeks of smog, and the Oregon Shakespeare Festival had to cancel 26 outdoor productions. So we're feeling it. We need to continue to tackle this with every single tool in our toolbox because it is the biggest challenge that we face. And future generations will judge us not on the fact of global climate change, but what we do to tackle it. So I've led to uh, reduce the carbon intensity of our uh, carbon fuels. Number two, we uh, brought uh, coal to clean, the first in the nation to uh, transition away from coal generated electricity and double our renewable energy portfolio by 2040. Lastly, invested in a transportation package, investing in EV vehicles and, and public transit. But most importantly, this isn't enough and we need to move forward. And I believe that we can move forward and reduce carbon emissions and create clean energy jobs by 5,000 if we move forward on the clean energy job bill. My opponent. Thank you, I'm so sorry. Steve. Uh, Representative Bueller, 30 years ago, Oregon's sanctuary law passed to the, with the approval and the applause of 87 of the state's 90 legislators. You told conservative talk radio you want to repeal it. You subsequently argued that local law enforcement shouldn't inter, excuse me, enforce federal immigration law, even as you advised OPB, there's too much confusion with regard to this. Clear that up for us, Newt, and explain how your support of ballot measure 105 reflects the values of this state. Yeah. Well, certainly uh, our immigration system is broken in, in this country. Uh, uh, and the main cause is, is a lack of progress at the federal level. And it's the fault of, of both parties, both the Democrat and, and Republicans. And it may, it's made all the worse by the divisive uh, political rhetoric of, of President Trump. And I've certainly deviated and don't agree with his approach to, to dreamers uh, with regards to separating families, uh, to even sending National Guard troops to, to, the, uh, to the border. Uh, uh, this is what we need to do. We need to add uh, clarity to where there is confusion right now. And no matter if Measure 105 passes or not as governor, I will make sure there is that clarity. And my policy will be based on this. Uh, one, no racial profiling absolutely will not be tolerated in Oregon. Number two, no matter if you're a citizen or here undocumented, you need, you need to feel safe and secure approaching law enforcement, especially if you're a victim or a witness to crime. And number three, if you're a criminal, you've been convicted or charged with a crime, they will be communication and collaboration between local law enforcement and federal immigration authorities. That will keep everyone safe in Oregon, no matter if you're a citizen or if you're here undocumented. So do you want to repeal the sanctuary law? I'm a yes on, on Measure 105. Okay. It's not something I, I'm campaigning on. And regardless if it's passed, uh, we need clarification uh, where there is confusion right okay. now. Governor. Oregonians value our immigrant and refugee communities. And on my watch, we've uh, remained a welcoming and inclusive state for all who call Oregon home. I oppose ballot measure 105. The reason was why it was passed in 1987 was because law enforcement was targeting the Latino population, people with brown skins. And I am concerned if it passes again, that racial profiling will continue and our communities will be less safe. Uh, that's why I oppose it. But I also opposed other uh, supported other legislation that encourages our immigrant communities, tuition equity for our dreamers, cover all kids, ensuring our document children have access to health care, uh, supporting the racial profiling legislation. I am not willing to collaborate with an administration that is ripping children away from parents and putting these children in cages. Thank you, Governor. Governor, every election we hear candidates say education is their top priority and they promise to improve the graduation rate. Yet in the 18 years I've lived in Oregon, it has not significantly improved. Under your watch, our graduation rate is still third from the bottom. What's going to be different if you're reelected? And can you give us a number? Where do you want the graduation rate to rank? What's achievable by the end of your term? Well, this is an issue, as you know, that Oregon has struggled with for decades, and it's absolutely unacceptable. I know what it feels like to have a child in my home not graduate from high school. 
we were fortunate. We had the tools and the resources they needed to make sure they got their GED. But not every family has that. On my watch, we've certainly made progress, but it's not enough. We saw the highest improvement in high school graduation rates since we started keeping track in 2017, and our communities of color saw a 7% increase uh, in their high school graduation rates as a result of significant investments we made in those communities. Moving forward, we need to make sure that every single high school student has access to career and technical education, and that we fully fund Ballot Measure 98. I know firsthand from the students that I've seen the importance of having hands-on learning. That means they get engaged in the classroom. They want to stay in school and it makes their, it connects the classroom to career and they want to graduate and it develops a skilled and qualified workforce. Can you give us a number, a graduation rate ranking by the end of your term? Middle of the pack, top third? 85% uh, 2022. Representative. Well, the, the hesitancy to, to give you a number, Laurel, it just shows the, the lack of leadership from the governor with regards to this important issue. In fact, just uh, two weeks ago, she said she has no control over this issue, even though she is superintendent and head of public schools and controls almost 70% of the budget that goes to our schools. It is the single biggest failure of Governor Brown is her indifference to fix our public schools. Uh, I will do it. I will lead where Governor Brown has not. And importantly, the biggest problem we need to face and solve is our classroom funding crisis, meaning not enough of the dollars are getting into kids in classroom learning to improve our graduation rate because it's going to a broken pension system. Now, Governor Brown uh, has not been able to talk to her most uh, potent allies to fix this prob problem, to fix the status quo. Uh, she won't, I will. Where will the graduation I rate rank by the end of your term if you're elected? Yeah, my vision is as ambitious but achievable. I'll lead Oregon schools from the bottom five in the nation. And yes, even though Governor Brown says there's been progress, we have the third worst still in, in the country. I'll lead Oregon schools from the bottom five in the nation to the top five in five years. I would like an opportunity for rebuttal. I think we're going to keep moving. It's okay. such a short hour. I'm, okay. I apologize. We have so many things we want to get through. And it is time for another video question. This one comes from Brittany Ruiz. Governor Brown, you will answer first. As a mother, I am very concerned that students do not get enough recess and PE. Currently, in Yamhill County, Public school students only get 15 minutes of recess and they take 30 minute lunch and cut it in half and give students another 15 minutes of recess. What would you do to make sure that there's more time spent enjoying the great outdoors? I think there's a couple of things. Uh, in 2015, we passed legislation to ensure that all of our students have access to physical education. And we did that because we know how poor important it is for our students to run and play and how good it is for their brains and how good it is for their bodies. So we need to fully implement that legislation, but we also need to fund it. The second piece is to work on connecting our young people to the outdoors. Oregon's uh, outdoors is beautiful. Uh, we are blessed with incredible bounty and we're working to make sure that all of our students, particularly in our underserved communities, have access to our outdoor experiences by removing both financial and physical barriers for our students. Finally, under my leadership, we've invested in our education system a 22% increase. I believe that there is more work to be done, but I don't think we can cut our way to a better education system, and I don't think we can cut uh, our teacher retirement and expect to build a world-class education system. If we're going to build a better education system, we need to invest in it. Representative. Yeah. Uh, just another example uh, where we're cutting back on our kids' education because of a classroom funding crisis that uh, Governor Brown won't address. Uh, too many of those dollars, even though we have record uh, budgets going to K through 12 schools, too many of those dollars aren't getting into to key programs, getting to, 
to teachers, getting to, to students. And what you'll see, despite record budgets all across the state of Oregon, school district after school district are giving teachers pink slips and cutting key programs like, like uh, uh, PE. Now, uh, Governor Brown uh, has increased the, the budget, uh, but uh, those dollars aren't getting to kids. In fact, the Oregonian just said two weeks ago that Governor Brown is trying to balance the state's budget on the backs of students, on the backs of kids. Uh, this problem has to be fixed. Governor Brown hasn't shown the leader, leadership that's needed to take on powerful entrenched interests to, to make sure that this problem does not put the state at risk any longer. Representative Bueller, I wanted to dive a little bit more into the state's pension crisis that you've touched on. Oregon has a $22 billion uh, public pension shortfall right now yet the government is still covering 100% of uh, the pension, uh, the payments into the pension fund. So should public employees be required to contribute to the pension fund? Yeah. Look, this, this issue with regards to our troubled pension plan uh, is an issue of vital concern. It, it, uh, it should be an issue of vital concern to hardworking uh, public employees. They should want me to be Oregon's next governor to address this problem. My concern for them, uh, if we don't fix it, uh, the pension they're expecting could be worth pennies on the dollar. And it's certainly an issue of vital concern to the, the kids I saw in Reynolds School District, 32 fourth graders per teacher. What I'll do is elevate this issue to the top of the political agenda by not signing a single new spending bill until I have a PERS reform bill on my desk. And some of the factors, some of the tenets of that bill I'd like to see is yes, public employees contributing to their own pension plan. I'd also stop the, the big monthly payouts, the $50,000 a month payouts that, that some people have got. I'd limit that at $100,000 a year final average salary calculation. And importantly, going forward, everyone in PERS has transitioned away from the troubled retirement plan into a typical 401k plan. That will put Governor, the state back you, on stable footing. Thank you. Uh, under my leadership, uh, we negotiated that all 98% of state public employees are picking up their 6%. So that's happening at the state level. I believe that public employees need to have some skin in the game and will continue to work toward that end. In 2003, the legislature made substantial changes to PERS. They stopped the Bilotti payments for Tier 3. And as a result, uh, the average state public employee makes roughly $2,300 a month on retirement. That's less than $30,000 a year. I think it's easy for a millionaire to say he's going to cut the retirements of hardworking Oregonians. I'm not willing to do that. We have firefighters who put their lives on the line this summer. They saved over 7,000 homes from burning up. I am not willing to cut their retirements. Um, can, may can I, I follow yes, up, can please? I, can Governor, I, um, I'm wondering if you can answer, though, you referred to the 401k style plan that public employees are contributing to now, and they also got raises as part of that but should they start contributing to the actual pension fund? Certainly, I think that public employees ought to have skin in the game. As I said, under my administration, 98% uh, of state public employees are picking up their 6%. I think we can do more. But here's the reality. These folks, our nurses, our teachers, our firefighters, our law enforcement, they put their lives on the line. They dedicate the best years of their, their lives to serving our children. I believe they deserve a safe, a secure, and affordable retirement. Representative Beeler, we'd like to give you a little more time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I'm disappointed that uh, Governor Brown would resort to a personal attack on this issue. This is about policy. This is an issue of vital concern to the state. Look, we all want uh, loyal public employees to have a secure and, and safe retirement fund. But we also have a, a problem in the state, a problem where we have a classroom funding crisis because despite record state school budgets, those dollars aren't getting into the classroom. And Governor Brown's uh, uh, supposed measures to improve this situation is, is really political theater. As, 
as you mentioned, uh, she takes away the 6% pickup but gives a 7% raise, 7% raise to some of her biggest financial contributors. That's not leadership, that's pandering, and that's avo avoiding one of the biggest problems facing Oregon for the next decade. Um, Governor Brown, given that we're <clears throat> talking about PERS, we're now into the morbid section of the uh, program. Um, but let's, in, on that, in that vein, the death penalty remains an emotional and divisive issue in this country. As governor, will you commute the death sentences of any or all of the 35 killers on Oregon's death row? At this point in time, I continued the moratorium uh, that uh, Governor Kitzhaber had in place. There is currently no pending executions, and so we have continued the moratorium, and under my watch, no one will be executed. Well, again, I'm, I'm curious about that at this point in time. I mean, mm -hmm. what might change, if anything? Are you committing that will, nothing will change if you have a second term Moving in office? Moving forward, I plan to continue the moratorium. Representative. Yeah, uh, I will follow the, the desires of the people of Oregon who voted on this issue and I will enforce the, the death penalty. Of course, as a, a governor, I will look at case by case and if I think there is injustice, uh, then I would commute a, a, a sentence. Uh, but I will follow the wishes of the people of Oregon and they've been very clear on this issue, Steve. All right, we have another video question. We've been talking a lot about teaching, and this one comes from a teacher, as a matter of fact. A high school teacher, and Representative Bueller, you will answer first. My name is Lindsay Ray, and I'm a high school math teacher in Beaverton. I work long hours to serve my students, and so I'm wondering, if you're elected governor, how will your policies affect the salary and benefits of educators like me? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the most important question facing uh, all of us right now is our underperforming uh, K through 12 education system. Uh, unfortunately, underperforming. Uh, underperforming in graduation rates. We have one of the shortest school years. And despite record budgets, record K through 12 budgets, what you'll find going across the state, including the Beaverton School District, that they were facing cutting 300 teachers. You may ask, why is that? Why are we cutting teachers and key programs at a time of record, record revenue? I'll tell you why, because those dollars aren't getting into the classroom because of a classroom funding crisis that Governor Brown will not address. We have to make hard decisions. We have to get those dollars back into the classroom. And importantly, we also have to increase our K through 12 budget. I'm proposing increasing at 15% the next two budget cycles. That'll allow Oregon to, to improve the situation in our schools, not have one of the worst graduation rates in the nation, and importantly, reestablish programs like career and technical education, which Governor Brown has not supported adequately. Governor. Yes, Lindsay, thank you for your question, and thank you to all the Lindsays in Oregon for your determination and dedication to serving our students. My understanding is my opponent's proposal would cut teacher retirement by 40%. As I said earlier, I don't think you can cut your way to a better education system. If we want a world-class education system, we need to invest in our teachers, and that's what I'm doing with our Educator Advancement Council to make sure that our teachers have the tools, the professional development, the mentoring and coaching needed to be successful in the classroom, and also that we uh, diversify the educator pipeline so it more reflects the diversity of our communities. In terms of retirement, I think it's critically important that you have a retirement uh, that you can uh, live on that's safe and secure. That's why I'm working with Republicans and Democrats to put money aside in Oregon's budget to pay down our debt, our unfunded actuarial liability. And we're doing that on a bipartisan basis because we know, I know, that the best thing we can do is uh, have funds set aside to buy down that employer rate. Thus, we can drive more dollars into our classrooms. Representative Bueller, the Metro Planning Agency has put a more than $650 million housing bond 
on the November ballot to help pay for much needed affordable housing in the Tri-County area. You've come out against that housing bond. As governor, how would you tackle the affordable housing problem? And if not with housing bond money, how would you pay for it? Yeah, uh, affordable housing has uh, reached almost crisis uh, situation, not only in the Portland metro area, but all across the, the state of Oregon. Uh, I am against the, the metro funded uh, bond. I do not think we need to expand the role of metro in this. And certainly, I do not think we should build a whole lot more public housing. Uh, but we need to address this situation right away. I think a better solution is provide rental assistance, keep people in place where they are, are right now, and I proposed a fund of $50 million. But that alone is not going to be enough. We also need to create 20,000 affordable and workforce housing units every year. We need to treat this like the, the emergency it is, and importantly, why we're doing both of those things, we need to work diligently to decrease the cost of actually building houses in, in Oregon. Under Governor Brown's administration, we've driven up the cost of housing with increasing regulations, zoning requirements. Uh, uh, that's not smart management. We need to decrease the cost of housing so everyone can afford to, to live comfortably in Oregon. Governor, go ahead. With my experience as a family law and domestic violence advocate, I know how critically important it is for every person to have a safe, dry, warm, affordable place to call home. I rolled up my sleeves the moment I became governor and we worked on building more affordable units because the best thing we can do is build places for people to live. In my first year, we uh, built 3,500, second year, 4,000. And this year, I'm proud to say we have about 7,800 under development. But that's not all. We gave our local communities more tools, speeding up permitting, and making sure that we can uh, build granny flats. There was a really important bill uh, that required uh, developers to include uh, affordable units in their developments. My opponent voted against it. He also voted against legislation that would you, uh, kick people can, out of their homes. Can I, re you. Can I rebut, rebut that? I mean, those, those are outlandish claims. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the governor talks a lot about uh, programs and percentages, but let's look at the, the results. The results show that homelessness has grown much worse under Governor Brown. We have the number one, the number one state in the nation for the number of homeless youth. So we can talk about programs, we can talk about dollars that, that Governor Brown has devoted to this problem, but the results speak for themselves. I have a vision that will turn this around and end homelessness in Oregon over the next Thank five you. years. Governor, we're gonna talk about homelessness right now, so, and the question will go to you. Thank you. Um, Governor Brown, homelessness is having a big impact on our community, such as kids who are struggling in school because they have to worry about where they're staying but at the height of the economic recovery at this point and on your watch, the problem is only getting worse. So what is Oregon getting wrong? We need to build more affordable units and my heart goes out to all the families that are struggling and we know we have over 23,000 children uh, that are housing insecure in our public school system. That's why it's so critically important that we use all the tools in our toolbox. In addition to the earlier tools I mentioned, my plan is to build, uh, spend $370 million on affordable units and get all of our children off the streets all of our children and their families. I think it's critically important that everyone supports the Metro bond measure. That will build, if ballot measure 102 passes, a technical constitutional fix, that will build an additional 12,000 units in the Portland metropolitan area. This is a challenge the entire West Coast faces. It's a challenge I've been working on since I became governor. The only uh, tool, uh, we can't just fix it on the affordable side, we also have to fix it on the market rate side. And that's what I'm doing. I passed legislation to encourage folks in the construction industry to move back to rural Oregon if they're dedicating a portion of their work to building housing. Look, the, the results speak for themselves. Under Governor Brown's administration, homelessness in Oregon has become a humanitarian crisis. Uh, 
public health crisis and increasingly a, a public safety crisis. And now not just in the Portland metro area, but all across the, the state of Oregon. Uh, I've rolled up my sleeves the last six months and looked at uh, successful programs and facilities all across the, the state that are really handling this, this well. And you'll find a commonality. And the commonality is those places that solve this problem, those cities, they, they offer compassion and a little tough love. Meaning they offer compassion, expect responsibility, and develop independence. As governor, I'll concentrate resources and funds on those kinds of programs that make a difference. I would like an opportunity to rebut. So my opponent is proposing to invest $50 million. That's a drop in the bucket. Since I became governor, we've invested 300 million, and I'm proposing that we invest 370 million more, not just to get our families and children off the streets, but are chronically homeless. And that means making sure they have wraparound services, including drug and alcohol treatment, including employment services, and obviously uh, access to comprehensive mental health. My opponent uh, opposes the very measures that uh, support low-income families. The $300 million I invested in went to rental assistance and it went to homelessness prevention. The tools to uh, uh, eliminate just cause eviction prevent people from being kicked out of their homes for no reason at all. I believe we need to move forward on that policy as well. We're gonna move on. We have another video question. Governor Brown, you will answer this one first, so take a listen. Hi, my name is Nicole. My question is, do you believe that parents have a right to make medical decisions for their children, including how and when they decide to vaccinate their children? Uh, do you have a certain age on that question? We don't, but I think talking okay. about vaccination, you know, you're starting, they start pretty early. So in terms of vaccination, I think one of the challenges we have, and we have a fairly, uh, uh, a law that protects parents' right to vaccinate their children in this state. I think the challenges that we are seeing is that we have a number of uh, communicable diseases that are impacting our communities around the United States because parents haven't been vaccinating. So I would say uh, we probably give uh, some parents a little too much leeway. If we want to make sure that we're protecting public health, we, make, we want to make sure that our uh, children have the vaccinations that they need. Representative. Yeah, uh, as a physician, I certainly uh, believe in the benefits of, of vaccination, but I also think that, that parents should have the right to opt out, to opt out for personal beliefs, uh, religious beliefs, or, or even if they have uh, strong alternative medical uh, beliefs, and, and that has been uh, beneficial. I think that gives people option and, and choice, and that's the policy I would continue to pursue as, as Oregon's governor. Hillary. All right, well, I'm gonna shift gears here to talk a little bit about transportation. So Representative Bueller, um, after years of planning and $200 million that was spent by the state of Oregon, the Columbia River crossing was scrapped five years ago. Uh, but in the last month, there has been renewed interest from several politicians to revive that I-5 bridge project. Do you think the state should re-engage and invest billions in new money in a bridge between Vancouver and Portland. Yeah, certainly there has been underinvestment in Oregon's transportation infrastructure for decades. Our, our bridges, our, our roads, our, our ports. Uh, and unfortunately, the Columbia River Crossing uh, project spent nearly $300 million in a, and not a single shovel of dirt was, was turned. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Governor Brown, when she was Secretary of State, didn't even look into that situation. It was her duty as head of audits. Uh, but we do need to invest more in our infrastructure. I voted against the, the transportation package uh, this last legislative session or the 2017 uh, session uh, because I didn't think it had enough investment for these types of important projects, especially for the Portland metro area. And I knew also that Governor Brown's policy was to, to bake into that legislation tolling. Tolling, importantly, not to build new bridges, like I think we should build a, a new bridge across the Columbia, but tolling to change people's behavior, to get them out of their, their vehicles and not to add capacity. Um, I'm against tolling for that purpose. Governor, go ahead. Yes, I think um, 
the, before we move forward on the Columbia River crossing, I want to see Washington meeting two criteria, that they are really serious about fixing the bridge and investing in that uh, bridge. And secondly, uh, that uh, it includes public transit, particularly light rail. Um, I think it's critically important that we make the seismic retrofitting needed on our bridges uh, because I saw what happened uh, in Minneapolis when the 35W bridge uh, went down. People were killed. Uh, none of my family was injured, fortunately. But as governor, I think it is my responsibility to make sure Oregonians are safe. My opponent voted against this transportation package, a bipartisan package, to invest in seismic re resilience in our roads and bridges. I don't know what he'd use to fix the Columbia River crossing since he's taking you, a no Governor. new taxes pledge. Scotch tape? Thank you. Governor, a state audit can, of Oregon's... Can, can, can I rebut that? No, we're going to keep going here. <laughs> A state audit of Oregon's foster care system in January found that state leaders and managers bullied and intimidated employees, discouraging them from speaking honestly with lawmakers and auditors. Critics say problems at the foster care agency were brought to your attention in 2015. What have you done to change the culture and to protect the nearly 8,000 children in Oregon's foster care system other than hiring a new director? What people don't know about me is that I'm a lawyer and I used to represent children in foster care system uh, when I was practicing law. And this is an issue that keeps me up every night. We've worked hard to make sure that our children are safe in the foster care system, that we are safely reducing caseloads, and we are working to recruit and retain uh, qualified foster parents and making sure that they have the support and services that they need. As governor, I'm focused on making sure that we tackle the root causes of the children in our foster care system. We have one and a half times the national average of children in our system. That means tackling substance and alcohol abuse. 75% of our children are in there due to one or more parents' use. It means tackling housing issues. As I mentioned, we've built 14,000 in the pipeline affordable units across the state and we're working to tackle domestic violence. All of these, I think, will ensure a foster system that is much improved. I have to tell you, this is a really tough nut to crack. Oregon has st struggled with this issue for many years. Representative Bueller. Uh, I, I would ask Governor Brown, how long is long enough to fix this problem? Governor Brown has been in Salem for over 25 years, in leadership positions for for more than half that time. It's been way too long. We have to save foster kids from the chaos, incompetence, and, and mismanagement, quite frankly, of the Brown administration. Look, I can't say it any nicer than that. It is one almost headline-grabbing story after another every month now. Our vulnerable foster kids, 8,000 kids who have no one else to turn to, deserve so much better. I propose fixing this problem. Last legislative session, cre creating a rapid improvement team to deal with the recommendations in the devastating audit. What Governor Brown said is the status quo is fine. We don't need to do anything more. And under just the pressure of her colleagues, did she finally buckle under and try to address this problem? Thank Our you, foster kids have waited much too long. We have several questions from volunteers with the Alzheimer's Association, and we want to play one of these now. Representative Bueller will answer first. Hi, I'm Michelle in Portland, and I'm a volunteer for the Alzheimer's Association. Alzheimer's is America's most expensive disease, and every 65 seconds someone develops the disease. As governor, what, how do you plan to make this disease a priority? Yeah. Well. Certainly, as a physician, I understand the importance of, of these chronic uh, diseases. Uh, uh, it, it is something that we need to bring attention to. Uh, certainly, a lot of this funding comes from the, the federal level. But the important role you can play as governor is to use that bully 
pulpit, to, to use your soapbox to talk about these kinds of devastating uh, uh, diseases, to go out there and encourage research and development and increase uh, awareness about how devastating it can be, not only for the people that have something like Alzheimer's disease, but also for the family that also has to care for the person who's been unfortunately uh, afflicted. That's the role as governor, to be caring and thoughtful and draw attention to these big issues that is causing families to struggle so much. Governor. My granny uh, lost her life to this chronic disease, and I know that many families in Oregon have been impacted it, by it. I think it's critically important uh, that we invest in research and have the best tools and medications available, but I also think it's important that we create uh, an elderly and senior care assisted living system that ensures that our seniors struggling with Alzheimer's or other diseases can stay in their homes or their apartments as long as possible and when they can't making sure that they can get the wraparound services that they need. It's also key for families struggling uh, with uh, members that have this disease to have important partnerships with the nonprofit community and making sure that families have access to supportive programs. I know it's been very healing for my family members, and I know it's healing for others. Representative Bueller, you've made leadership an issue in the campaign, and I'm searching for some on climate change. You're anti-coal but pro-fracking. You've dismissed a carbon tax as an attempt to generate a $1.4 billion slush fund for green energy profiteers. When the threat of climate change has never been more urgent, why the milk toast argument that Oregon has done or paid enough to address the problem? Yeah. Uh, well, Steve, I reject a, a lot of the premises of your question, as you can imagine. Uh, I certainly believe in, in climate change, and that's why I was one of the few Republicans to, to vote to transition Oregon away from coal-based electricity to renewable in energy sources. It's why I've spoken out frequently against the Trump's administration uh, policies, uh, specifically with regards to withdrawing the United States from the climate uh, accords. Uh, I'm against uh, Governor Brown's cap and trade. Uh, a plan or uh, probably a better description of it is a 1.4 billion dollar sales tax on on energy and I'm against that because it's going to hit hard-working Oregonians Oregonians who are struggling to pay the bills right now with a sales tax that they can't afford and importantly those dollars won't go to schools they won't go to providing health care they're going to go to a complex tax credit scheme for green energy companies. And look, we've already had problems with that in the past, something called the Business Energy Tax Credit Scheme, where hundreds of millions of dollars were misallocated to the extent that people have gone to jail for corruption. I don't want to repeat that again. Governor Brown. Well, the League of uh, Oregon Conservation Voters agrees with you. Uh, my mm -hmm. opponent has a lifetime ranking of an F. Uh, based on his three years voting record in the Oregon legislature. I've continued to make steady, incremental progress on tackling global climate change, from reducing the carbon intensity of our fuels, uh, from transitioning off of coal, from investing in EV uh, rebates and public transit, which my vo opponent voted against. And we worked hard last session to reduce carbon emissions. We weren't able to uh, successfully complete the legislation, but we are working collaboratively with utilities, with the business community, and with the ag sector to make sure that we reduce carbon emissions in such a way that it doesn't exacerbate already existing economic disparities in our low-income communities Thank and you. our rural communities. This question comes from Mike Marsh and Representative Bueller. You will answer first. Are you concerned with the leadership of the president? And if you are concerned, what will you do to lead differently in Oregon? Yes, certainly President Trump doesn't provide a model of leadership for, for me. The, 
the political divisive speech, uh, and for that matter, tweets, uh, I do not find uh, appealing. Uh, I think leaders bring people together. They unite people around a common goal, and importantly, they build bridges, not walls. And it's why I've spoken out against uh, President Trump's uh, not only politically divisive speech, but many of his policies with regards to immigration, climate change, cutting of, of, of Medicaid. Uh, I'll lead with an uh, uh, open mind, a caring heart, and a thoughtful voice. I'll be an independent governor who will lead for all of Oregon, or Oregonians, no matter who you are, where you live, who you love, or no matter uh, if you're registered to vote as a Democrat, Independent, or Republican. Uh, that's true leadership, and leadership takes on these big, important issues that Governor Brown has avoided, ignored, and quite frankly, made a lot worse in her time in office. Governor. Yes, um, I think it's really important that the governor speak out whenever this president stomps on Oregonians or Oregon values, and there are many issues, immigration, health care, the environment. Uh, in terms of health care, when this administration tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act, literally stripping out health care from 430,000 Oregonians. We fought back with every tool in our toolbox. We showed them that as a result, we have many Oregonians with health care, but also it created over 23,000 jobs. Now they're trying to take away health care from Americans with chronic heart conditions, with pre-existing conditions. I find this unacceptable. I talked to a young man by the name of Jacob. He's so talented. He has a chronic heart disease. Uh, this administration would rip health care away from him. Oregon won't let uh, that happen, but the rest of the country will. I will continue to fight this administration until every Oregonian has access to the health care they need to lead healthy and productive lives. Thank you, guys. That hour went very quickly. Oh. Thanks to everyone at home who sent in great questions. We thank our panelists and, of course, the Oregonian, our partners, for this debate. Ballots will arrive in the mailbox probably beginning next week. So don't forget, fill them out and vote. Have a good night. Thanks for being with us. This debate has been sponsored by AARP Oregon.